Um, thanks, and thanks um, to Anat for hosting and for all of you for coming today. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. Um, make sure that this works. Okay. There. That's it. Great. So um, when Antonio and I started to dig into um, the literature review and, and, do, and the, doing the background paper before the meeting, um, as, as Paul said, to kind of put a ring fence around this, um, we first sort of had to look at, at what do we mean by engagement and what are the various approaches and definitions that people use, because it's not a word that we all use um, as, perhaps as commonly um, as possible. And so we looked at um, the three most common terms are really around participation and participatory processes which are meant to engage people in various aspects of programming and operations, but they don't always include a lot of power in the decision-making processes. Um, some agencies see participation um, as a means to an end, while a few and typically sort of multi-mandate and rights-based organizations may see participation as an end in itself. Um, a second area is around accountability systems and processes, um, and these are, uh, have been established to hold humanitarian aid responders accountable for their actions and in to ensure that they use their power responsibly. Um, and the third area where there's been a lot of work, especially in the last few years, is around communications um, in terms of methods and systems for both providing people affected by crises with information um, to listen to them, to um, gather their views, and, and to sort of facilitate more, more dialogue and, and to facilitate more engagement. Um, when you look at the range of, of approaches that are used by humanitarian actors, some are, are seen to be more engaging and sort of empowering, um, and, and, and for some more meaningful um, than others. And we tried to look at this in terms of the, the largely in terms of the amount of influence and decision making that people have. Um, so, if you look at um, we sort of starting with information provision, which is a very sort of one way providing information to people, all the way through sort of consultative processes, through two-way communications, uh, through accountability processes, through participation and partnerships between organizations and people, and lastly to, to ownership. Um, most of these are approaches that have been initiated by outsiders. Um, and at the same time, it was acknowledged and I think quite discussed quite a lot how much communities and people who are affected by crises and the governments and local organizations are themselves engaged um, and the ways that they want to engage. But the, this, is, and this is really what we mean by ownership. There's a lot of local leadership, um, but what we were trying to look at um, in this paper was largely how outsiders and those coming in to help are trying to engage with those who are already affected. And the discussions in Addis um, really focused a lot on the, the effectiveness of these approaches um, with engaging people and not necessarily on, on the other way around. Um, one of the things that we thought was really important was, and, and it came up a lot in the discussions too, was the reasons for engaging. Um, and there's not a lot of clarity um, from people often on what they're trying to do. Um, and the theories of change that people have and the practices um, point sort of to three different rationales. So you find some organizations are, are doing this um, for sort of value, you know, based on their values and because it's the right thing to do. Um, that is a way of respecting rights of and dignity of people and to act in solidarity with them. And so they see this as, as fundamental to their, to their, you know, reason and, and their way of operating. Other organizations, and sometimes the same organization in different contexts, may take more in, have more instrumental goals, which are about making their programs more effective and more efficient. And the third um, reason is really sort of the emancipatory, that we have to address the structural in inequalities and the root causes of crises, and to really give voice and agency to people um, to, to solve those and to address, address them. And when you look at the approaches that agencies take, um, you know, information provision or consultation might be enough to sort of fulfill the instrumental goals. Well, for emancipatory goals, you have to have greater levels of participation and ownership. You need to be further along that, that sort of spectrum. Um, and obviously, in, in humanitarian action, there's a lot of tensions between these goals and sometimes between our principles. Um, and at the meetings, there were a lot of discussions on this, and I think we'll probably get into it in the, in, in, afterwards. Um, you know, whereas some do not believe that empowerment and sort of working on that emancipatory end of the spectrum is, is a goal that we as humanitarians should have. Um, but at the same time, most people agreed that we need to be supporting positive social, ch social change and that that really is a key rationale um, for engaging people. Um, so the discussions in Addis also highlighted um, 
a lot of a lot of the literature and a lot of our thinking has been about the bilateral relationships. So it's how our agency engages with you know this affected population or this organization, and that really we have to look at the multilateral relationships that exist. There are a lot of different actors that are engaged in humanitarian responses. A lot that are affected. You know, we have the local organizations and the different parts of the government. You have international organizations and the range of those military, private sector actors. A lot of different ones, but. What we often found is that you know the preventive action and a lot of the initial responses are often led by individuals um, and governments, but these aren't really well documented. And we really have to have a better understanding of that as international aid agencies to look at how we can most effectively engage and support those efforts. Um, some of the people in you know in, in Addis, I think some of the discussion suggested that we really should be about how those are affected want to be engaging want to be engaged and how they want to be engaging with us rather than looking at it often often the other way around. Um, but since the literature and, and most of the meeting focused on the effectiveness of, of the approaches, that's what we looked at. Um, oh, there. Uh, so on the first, just taking these kind of three most common approaches, a lot of the panels and reports um, looked at on communications highlight how there is a lot more information and communications, um, and it's been particularly aided by the use of a lot of new technologies in 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 some locations. And we saw that, and we certainly saw that in the typhoon um, Haiyan Yolanda response um, last year. Um, information is more widely recognized as a right and as something that needs to be provided, along with food and water and, and, and shelter and so on. Um, and then, and women in particular, and, and others on some of the panels highlighted. Um, people that came from affected communities, you know, highlighted the importance of access to information and communication and helping them to prepare for crises, to make better decisions, and to hold their agencies and governments accountable. Um, however, at the same time, there's a long way to go to ensure that the views and the voices of those who are most affected are heard and in, and in really influencing critical decisions. So we still have a, a ways to go. Um, on accountability, um, the focus on accountability, you know, has been shown over the last uh, to improve in humanitarian quality and effectiveness. Um, but the progress has has been uneven. Um, some agencies have invested a lot of time and effort and staff and, and resources and developed a lot of frameworks and tools, but others have not. Um, and while there are a lot of, of good examples uh, shared at the meeting of how people have also been able to hold their governments accountable, so to even work on social accountability. Um, and to go beyond the sort of very, you know, accountability of, of humanitarian agencies alone, um, much of the emphasis is still at the sort of project and service delivery level um, and, ha and has not really been looking at improving sort of a collective accountability. And we haven't gotten to the point where, we're, where we have really systematic uh, accountability systems and processes. Um, lastly, and participation. Um, there are a lot of examples, both in the literature and from the meeting, and many agencies have a lot of, um, you know, guidelines and tools on participation, um, and a lot of examples of how people are engaged in various aspects of humanitarian programs. Um, one of the things that certainly came out a lot in the meeting was the need to invest in the skills and the capacities of staff to facilitate engagement, um, and that it's not just a technical. Um, area and field of, of, uh, um, of work that is something that is really a cross-cutting issue. Um, some of the examples of engaging people effectively in decision-making processes had, all, had also led agencies to make changes in their own approaches and systems. And so there has to be an openness to that from the agencies themselves, um, to learning and adapting when they do engage. And, and um, some of the agencies um, have even gone as far in as as working with people to support their engagement and policy processes and, and changing policies, um, such as ensuring equal access to compensation for women. Um, and one of the things that I think was really a recurrent theme in, in Addis was certainly about how humanitarian agencies' roles are changing um, and how we may need to be seeing ourselves more as facilitators and brokers rather than sort of experts and doers, that, that it is a very much of a, a, a process um, rather than, than a technical area of expertise. Um, a last, an another aspect um, that was talked a lot about is the role of the state. Um, and that, uh, particularly in disaster preparedness and in response, and particularly in, in middle income countries, obviously this varies. Um, but there are, and, and I think a lot of the discussions were about how the challenges for humanitarians to, to engage with. Um, with people who may be in opposition to the state and even being able to access them. 
Um, but participants agreed, I think, that you know, it's important um, for us to figure out how to engage. Um, and even in that we have to, in, in both for our sort of in terms of also all the, the goals that we looked at in terms of engagement, you could look at that in terms of how people are engaging with the state and the role that it has um, at, uh, in terms of representing um, itself, but also affected people and, and how it, it's engaging itself with, with people um, who've been affected by disasters and crises. Um, for the agencies who to take a more developmental and long-term approach, they're, they may be a lot more comfortable with working on this and to working towards this more emancipatory goal. Um, and, and there was some discussion, I think Antonio will, 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 will talk about a bit too, that you know, there were not as many, um, I think, participants perhaps from the, from the sort of donantist end of the spectrum in terms of, of a, at the meeting. I think we had a lot more representation from more multi-mandate agencies who, who agreed with this um, approach. So um, one of the things, ooh, it's flashing. <laughs> Um, that that was certainly a, a recurring theme as well were were the constraints to engagement um, and a lot of these are, are known they're not new um, and they cover things uh, in blue you have sort of operational issues such as costs and access um, information and transparency and how much we share um, and the issues around replicability and scalability what works in one context may not work in another and um, what works in a very small scale may not work at a large scale um, a second area around staffing and sort of what are the skills, the attitudes, the behaviors that are, that are needed to effectively engage with people and how do we deal with that when we have a lot of short-term <coughs> assignments and this is, engagement is fundamentally about relationships um, and, and um, so it's important to look at the people that are involved. Um, a third area was around humanitarian structures and procedures in terms of what we see in terms of the projectization, um, the drive for sort of evidence, measurement and reporting and institutional challenges. Um, and the supply-led paradigm. We're still very much about getting it there, getting it quickly, um, and, and, and not as much on the process sometimes. And lastly, um, about the power relations, that there's a lot of, uh, you know, needing to look at the power relations within the local context, um, and a lot of concern about who, who's engaged, and whether the people that we're engaging with are really representative of, of those um, who are most affected and those that are marginalized. Um, and also power relationships within humanitarian activities between the different actors and inside of aid agencies came up as well in terms of headquarters field and so on. So um, some of the key issues um, that came up um, are that there is certainly a lot of demand for greater engagement. Um, first and foremost from crisis affected people themselves. Um, and they are looking for all forms of engagement as described. Um, and that's been, I think, well established, well documented. Um, a second is that there are a lot of lessons and guidance and methods and tools from development actors for furthering engagement. And um, a, a number of people, especially again, you know, some who may be coming from more of a developmental background or coming from multi-mandate agencies, you know, said there is a need to connect relief and development efforts a lot more um, and that we can, we can do a better job of uh, of, of connecting our, our different approaches and learning from one another. Um, the roles and the expectations and the priorities of affected communities and of humanitarian actors themselves are changing and they're very different in different contexts and we have to understand that better. Um, another issue that came up a lot in quite a, lot, a number of the panels was that, you know, the, the importance of people and the preparedness matters and that um, there were a lot of good facilitators and agents, where it had worked well, agencies had invested um, resources and support and training to enable their staff um, to engage and their partners to engage. And a lot of the time, this was done before the crises had occurred. I think some of the positive things that we saw in the Philippines was because there's been a lot of disasters and relationships and lessons learned built up over time that could be quickly applied um, in, in the most recent disaster. Um, and lastly, just, you know, while we know that we have to act fast, we, we do need to think longer term in the process. So, last sort of, um, oop. so, where do we go from here? And I think these are the kind of the questions that were left, um, some of the questions that were left at the end. Um, there's a need and for a lot more clarity on the goals um, of engagement and negotiation sort of on the terms of engagement from all those involved. And to be clear about, you know, if we're really aiming for a more instrumental approach or, or even a, 
um, you know, if we're really aiming for, for more, going for more emancipatory, what are we trying to achieve? Um, and what is it that the people we're trying to engage with want to achieve? Um, there's also a realization that we have to talk about and deal with issues of power, um, both in the context in which we're working and within and between humanities um, and with the governments. Um, that the con a third, that the, sort of the context in which our responses are taking place are really different and that no single approach, no toolbox, no single method is going to work everywhere. Um, and that we really have to n know a lot more about how people want to be engaged and how they already are um, to support that. Um, and another interesting piece came up was wh understanding why people disengage um, and better understand when trust has been broken and how do we deal with that. Um, we may be coming, you know, we're coming in often not the first people um, and agencies that people have dealt with. There's a long history of engagement and sometimes it's not been very good. And so w our, our well-meaning um, approaches and attempts may not actually work um, and we need to understand the history a little bit. Um, and lastly, we need to take more time to listen, um, more time to reflect, to learn, and to keep repeating the, um, with, the, with those who are affected by crises. We've got to be learning together um, and not, not alone. And that that is a part of the, the engagement process is, is being able to, to have that dialogue uh, more honestly about what works and what doesn't um, so that people can really feel that they've been meaningfully engaged. So I will stop there. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, as you can see, uh, th thank you so much for, for, for covering an awful lot of ground. There's a lot in the report. I, I had the opportunity to, to read it as it was being written, and there's really a, a, a lot of a lot to think of in there. I wonder if we could just go straight to to you um, for any sort of questions or comments, and perhaps just start just as a way of kind of kicking off with with anything particularly around any of these issues which which Antonio and Dana kind of pulled out as, as being some of the by no means all of but but some of the some of the sort of deep themes of the of the meeting. So the the fact that this is about power at many levels, the the contextual nature of engagement, the fact that we don't necessarily mean the same things when we talk about participation or accountability and we don't even always know quite why we're doing it. Um, the fact that this has been very much sort of driven perhaps by the things that we would like our agencies to be doing in a perfect world without actually ever really asking people how they wanted to, and whether they wanted to engage with, with our agencies, and how they engage with you know, the degree to which different agencies look different. So all of these things out here. Does anyone have any questions or comments to kick us off? Please. Hi, I'm Robert Schofield, um, an independent consultant these days. Um, uh, I've been in this business for about 15 years, and I was just in uh, northern Iraq last month, and I was surprised myself how easy it is to be in the thick of programming and actually not put affected populations at the front and centre. And you know, I've been in the accountability movement for, for several years as well. So, you know, I understand the challenge. I'm interested in the discussions that you had and through this study, um, what innovative practices you came across that deal with some of these things of power and, you know, one size not fitting all and, you know, disengagement and all the rest of it. But um, w were there some innovative practices that you think are worth sharing, bearing in mind they're not going to fit every situation? Great question, thank you, Robert. We'll take we'll take a couple more, um, and then and then throw it back to Antonio and to Dana. Alex. Great, thanks. Uh, I'm Alex Jacobs from Plan International. So, like Robert, I'm starting to rack up the number of years I've been having these debates, and I'm sure, like many of you here, I'd be interested in. You know, it's. I think you've done a fantastic job. It's great to get this summary of the discussions from Ethiopia. So, thank you very much for that. There's a wide range of issues. A lot of them are quite familiar. I'm sure they were very familiar to you, in particular, as the authors. And I'm sure they're very familiar to many of us here. And I'm sitting here 10 years ago, I was involved in writing the first HAP standard. And the analysis looked pretty much exactly like what you've got up on the, the slides behind you. And, and of course, issues to address these, uh, excuse me, initiatives to address these predate that. 
So my question is, what have we learned from our efforts, our systematic, our system-wide efforts to improve how we engage with affected po uh, populations, which can inform our current initiatives to do just the same thing? Because it, I can't be alone in thinking, this is a huge circle we've been around a lot of times before, and really what you're presenting here is evidence that our progress has been completely inadequate. Um, thank you very much. Margie Buchanan-Smith, um, also independent consultant, and I won't count the number of years in the sector. But um, I, yeah, I guess what I'm really curious about is what you found in terms of, of any good or innovative practices in really challenging conflict environments where politically it may be very oppressive and and of course what we're increasingly seeing is humanitarian agencies having less and less access to affected populations and I'm just I'm curious in any insights as to how that affects the relationship the power relationship between the agencies um, and the affected population and is there anything positive coming out of those situations because you know it challenges us hugely as humanitarian agencies and are there any of those challenges that are actually positively making us rethink our role and how we engage? We'll, we'll take those. I think that's probably enough. I'm so glad I'm not answering these questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so we'll take those three to start and then, and then see, we go, so, see where we go from there. Antonio, can I, can I throw one or more of those over to you? 